Centre of Arts London. Welcome to uh, the webinar of the London School of Economics um, and within it, the Institute of Global Affairs. Uh, we are part, as many of you know, um, our determining uh, uh, audience, we are part of the school, a new school of uh, um, public policy. My name is Piroska Nagy Mohácsi uh, and I am the interim director of the Institute of Global Affairs. Before we get started today with a very exciting program, uh, let me uh, give you a few housekeeping matters. If you want to tweet, uh, use the Twitter, the hashtag is uh, hashtag LSC policy. Uh, the event being recorded, we are obligated to tell you that and uh, in the very much hope that we can post, uh, post it uh, online uh, barring no technical difficulties. And finally, I'd like to invite you to use your Q&A uh, function to uh, raise questions as the speakers um, uh, speak uh, or, or during the discussion. I will be monitoring and uh, according to my best, I, I will try to call on uh, and, and use as many questions as possible um, in, in this interaction. But now let's begin. Um, this is a new series that we are launching. It's called a Reform Policy in the Making, in which five, six outstanding uh, true reformers will be presenting to you their experience based actually on a book or, or a big essay that they have just recently completed. Um, curiously, um, out of the five we are planning thus far, we four are women, so um, leadership and reform making seems to be in our little sample, uh, seems to be associated with, with, um, with, with, with um, uh, excellent uh, women leadership. The first uh, in our series, uh, and, and I'm greeting uh, with, with a great respect um, and admiration, uh, are Valeria Contareva. She is currently a senior policy fellow at our institute at the LSE, um, but she of course is very well known um, as a former governor of the National Bank of Ukraine, where she uh, led uh, one of the most difficult uh, reforms ever uh, in human history in the context of, uh, um, of um, a big economic and political and military, I, I might add, crisis. Uh, she had to preside over, uh, over the, um, the whole complete remake of the uh, financial sector, the banking sector, to stabilize the economy. And she also had to restructure the central bank itself to make it fit for purpose. Um, she, by training, is a banker. So she, she, she was bringing uh, her, her um, rich expertise as a, as, as a private sector participant into into the realm of the central banking and, and even reforming everything that, that, that she touched. She has a new book, which she calls a manual for reforms, but frankly, this is much, much more that it's a very, very rich insight into, uh, into um, how, how you design reforms, what are the obstacles you have to, to, to consider to overcome, and how to be a very, even being a central banker, a very canny, um, um, policy, uh, policy player, a political uh, player. After that, we uh, hope to have two discussions. One is already uh, with us, uh, with Professor Paul Thompson, uh, who recently re retired uh, from the IMF after a very distinguished career. I will introduce Paul uh, um, in a little bit more detail when, when, when he starts speaking. And we also hope to, to have another discussion, Katarina, Matanova, uh, she's having some connection difficulty, but we hope that we overcome that. Um, it's a real pleasure to, 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 to welcome Paul and Katerina because they are themselves on their own right, are, are reformers uh, in their own area, the institution, and, and, uh, and they're very known for out-of-box uh, um, uh, policy thinking. And now we will start, but let's make it interesting a little. Um, we will draw a poll. Some of you are familiar with, with, uh, with this uh, feature, feature of ours. We like to poll our audience. Um, and I am going to um, invite you to participate in this poll now, putting out the questions. Because one of the big questions is that how and when to reform. So the question I'd like to pose to you is the following. The crisis or crises are supposed to be an opportunity for change. Never waste a crisis, as, as so many, so many, so many people have have, uh, have have claimed to have said. 
Do you think it is possible to major reforms in the middle of a very serious crisis? So do you think it's possible to reform in the middle of a big crisis or not? So um, you can say yes, um, um, because in fact, big reforms can be started only when the usual political barriers uh, and obstacles uh, seem to crumble and, and can be overcome. Or you can say no, the best is to, to get out of the crisis very quickly and, and start uh, reforms afterwards. So please um, take your time and, 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 and uh, let's hear your voice. And Piroshka, I just want to say that I'm connected and I heard everything. Katarina, wonderful. Okay. To be with yeah, us. I'm here. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Let me wait just a little bit uh, because we are still waiting uh, for. And I really don't have to wait too much longer. It seems that. Uh, that those who voted, the vast majority, 79% thinks that reforms can be only started when there is a big crisis. Uh, okay, so that gives us really a, a good, good start. Um, and, um, and I'm going to give the floor uh, to our main speaker, uh, Valeria Gontareva. Uh, Hello, everybody, uh, dear, my dear colleagues. I'm very happy to be here today uh, with you. I'm very happy to see uh, Katerina Maternova and uh, uh, Paul Thompson uh, because it's absolutely the team who did all reforms, which I will describe later on today. And uh, I'd like uh, today is really a presentation of my book. Uh, my book uh, is not a memoir. My book is a practical manual. And uh, uh, of course, I'm very, very proud uh, that uh, uh, my book is the first in series uh, policy uh, reform in making. It's a new series with Institute of Global Affairs recently introduced. Thanks to Eric Berglaff uh, and Piroshka, uh, it was a success story, and my book is the first book in this series. But I'd like to tell you that uh, I especially call it uh, Practical Manual, because a lot of uh, different books about reforms, but I truly believe maybe it's a very ambitious aim that my book could really help reformer uh, to start and amplify waves of reforms. Uh, and today, of course, we will discuss with you uh, our reforms and maybe major problems and obstacles which I see uh, we have. Uh, I will uh, start to show uh, my uh, presentation to you. It's a very, very short uh, the, uh, and you will see it's a book. Uh, the book Mission Possible the true story of Ukrainian comprehensive banking reform and practical manual for other nations. And uh, the really different type of this book, it's uh, like I mentioned, is a practical manual and I truly believe that it could be a reformer's guide. Of course, I'd like uh, this book could be a Bible of all reformers, but unfortunately it's not a reality. That's why let's call it a reformer's guide. And uh, you will find a lot of uh, real, very, very, very valuable uh, insights uh, because uh, it's a very, very practical. Uh, for example, if you'd like to do new monetary policy, please read uh, chapter six. If you'd like to switch from fixed uh, foreign exchange rate uh, to really uh, flexible uh, exchange rate, please read uh, the chapter number three. And we can could count uh, endlessly, uh, this book is with me. Uh, that's why you can observe uh, later on um, a lot of um, uh, different, uh, very valuable uh, advices uh, here. And uh, the main idea of all reformers, it's not about ideas, it's about implementation. And I truly believe that when uh, reformers start to do reforms, the main uh, question, uh, how we should start, what the first we should do, 
and uh, I think you will find uh, a lot of uh, really um, very very practical uh, advice and guides uh, from this book. Uh, because if I recall a very difficult time in Ukraine, and you will see maybe when my uh, story started, it's uh, uh, Kiev 2014, the Revolution of Dignity. It's uh, really a start of my story because I was nominated the governor of Central Bank in June 2014. Uh, and uh, it's exactly uh, the place uh, which you see right now in this slide. It's uh, our uh, main uh, central square. It's an independent square uh, called Maidan. Uh, this square, it's exactly 200 meters from my office, from my office when I was a governor of the central bank. But uh, this slide show you uh, the reality. Uh, our country was in ruins just physically in ruins because first of all we already lost Crimea uh, after we, uh, it was a really a bloody war in our eastern part of Ukraine in Donbass when we lost 10 percent of our territory and circa 20 percent of our GDP of course our balance of payment was torn to pieces uh, our exchange rate is a mirror of your balance of payment was absolutely also turned to, to pieces. And uh, it was absolutely, I will not even talking about legacy of previous 20 years. It was absolutely incredible, non-sustainable imbalances. And that's why Ukrainian economy was uh, absolutely not uh, competitive with life in this time anymore. That's why, you know, no doubts that reforms uh, and a very, very um, uh, rapid response uh, were needed. And that's why uh, uh, maybe we will see the um, uh, next uh, slide. It's, uh, my book is called Mission Possible, but I will tell uh, maybe why it's called Mission Possible. Because in October 2014, I met uh, in Washington, I met uh, Stanley Fisher, you know, Stanley Fisher, he's a guru of uh, finance. And that time uh, Stanley Fisher was uh, first chairman, uh, uh, vice chairman of uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank. And uh, I asked uh, uh, the meeting with um, uh, Stephen Fisher myself, and I could explain you why, because he was uh, a governor of Israeli Central Bank. In uh, Israeli Central Bank, he was in exactly the government of Israeli Central Bank during the war time. That's why for me it was absolutely crucial to get his opinion about what should we do in war time. Because when your country was not prepared for war, when your military expenditure was not even envisaged in your budget, in the same time when you uh, faced all these absolutely incredible uh, disbalances, because Ukraine, uh, that when I joined Central Bank, we had no reserves. Our treasury account, uh, really treasury account of our country was zero. Uh, of course, it was negative, but unfortunately, it was not uh, any overdraft. That's why it was just zero, no copy, no one uh, pound, no one US dollar in your account. You need uh, military expenses. You have no currency reserves. You, you had a uh, peg US dollar rate and uh, no monetary policy, absolutely ill banking system tons of non-viable banks, what should we do? And uh, as you see, um, his answer was, when he uh, heard my story, he said, no, mission impossible. I don't know how to help you because normally, for example, in Israel, uh, the budget uh, military expenses was always uh, financed through uh, different sources and blah, blah, blah. That's why uh, when I returned to Ukraine, uh, I told to my team that, sorry, uh, Stephen Fisher said that mission was impossible. But uh, in three year time, we completed all major reform of financial and banking sector. And uh, just in three year time, we moved to flexible exchange rate. And also we implemented new monetary policy of inflation targeting. We clean up our Ukrainian banking system from insolvent banks and enhanced in its resilience. 
we built a powerful modern independent central bank. We transformed uh, central bank completely because when I joined a uh, central bank, believe me, it was like medieval uh, monster. But when I left central bank, it was a real modern independent central bank. We rebuilt all internal processes. We turned uh, it uh, to completely a reorganized institution. Uh, institution with fully functioning supervisory uh, committee, credit committee, financial stability, monetary policy committee, and process management committee. Believe me, it was <laughs> really very, very powerful transformation. And um, uh, what, what was our priorities? And why we are talking about uh, reform? Reform is all, all, always strategy, tactic, and priorities. That's why the first priority for us, of course, was microfinancial stability. The second was cleaning up of Ukrainian banking sector. And the third was transformation of a central bank itself. The main idea that all these three priorities we started to do in parallel. And I could explain you why. Macrofinancial stability could, could not be created on the basis of unstable, non-transparent, and is, insufficient banking sector. Sim similarly, it is not possible to truly clean up the banking uh, sector without restructuring decision-making process and strengthening the institution capacity of the central bank itself. That's why when we are talking about priorities, uh, uh, I show you all these three priorities, but you need to start to do all of that in parallel because otherwise success story, it's not visible at all. And, um, uh, our success story, mm, mm, so, uh, sorry, maybe it, it, it uh, oh my God, <laughs> sorry, sorry, it's already, it's not so easy, my presentation. Okay, uh, the next slide. It's about our success story was not happened by chance. It was a, what I already mentioned to you. I will not bother you with the uh, Ukrainian banking system because believe me, uh, when I joined Central Bank, it was like a really horror movie uh, because uh, it was some zombie banks, oligarch banking and uh, banks with no assets, no capital. Uh, that's why uh, some banks were just money laundering machine. Uh, that's why finally we clean up Ukrainian banking system. Uh, we sent uh, 100 banks for just for liquidation because it was not uh, really a bank, it was zombies. And one bank, the biggest uh, private bank which belonged to Ukrainian oligarch was nationalized. And uh, it's our uh, story. Uh, our success story was not happened by, by chance. Uh, um, and of course, our uh, experience transforming the banking sector and central bank was recognized like a success story. But as I told you, it was not happened by chance because we had a mission, vision, we had a detailed strategy and action plan, and we had values and leadership. And of course, without international support, we could have no one maybe chance to survive. That's why today with us, our main sponsor, sponsors of our success is IMF. And I truly believe that IMF is the best uh, uh, IFIs in this world. I truly believe that it's, uh, mm, it, it, it's a real leader. And of course, I also would like uh, to thank uh, European Union and Katerina Maternova because she was the real uh, leader in this uh, Ukrainian transformation and our banking sector transformation as well. What we finally, uh, as a result uh, in Ukraine, uh, after our reform, uh, Ukraine, you, you know, I mentioned not have, but had, and we will discuss why maybe I mentioned had. Uh, when I left Central Bank uh, three years um, uh, after, of course, it was my personal decision. It was not uh, any uh, political decision. It was my personal decision. Of course, my decision was caused by absolutely incredible uh, sustained harassment and even some threats uh, of oligarchs uh, and threats, uh, physical threats and all of that. But frankly speaking, it was my uh, decision uh, because all uh, main uh, 
reforms and uh, were already completed. And I said in my uh, final speech in the parliament that my mission uh, already completed, yes. And that's why at that time Central Bank was truly independent modern Central Bank and uh, a transparent and well capitalized banking system that generates highest profit in history and uh, sound monetary policy uh, that contributed to sustainable economic growth and international recognition as a role model uh, for uh, a modern and transparent central bank. And uh, uh, all of that I could say uh, about central bank even half a year ago. And we will discuss maybe la later on, um, uh, could we um, hope for the same and what should we do to uh, prevent um, and uh, reverse of reforms. And uh, of course, it's also uh, maybe a just slide for our discussion because I truly believe that uh, COVID-19 time, it's really time for reforms. Uh, because my personal observation is uh, that um, uh, we are ready to do reforms only when we face perfect storm. When we uh, stay already on uh, bricks of precipice. And absolutely, when you have absolutely no other way but, doing ref but to do reform. But in the same time, uh, we should not be afraid of word uh, reforms. Uh, because reforms, uh, you know, uh, it's a simple definition of reform is to make changes and improve, uh, improve efficiency. When government and central banks spend enormous money to save life and jobs, we can in parallel improve pro uh, processes and eliminate inefficiencies. That's why uh, when my book was already uh, uh, finished, I added a special chapter. It's a chapter num number 13. It's a policy response of, 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 on COVID-19 times. And I truly believe, and you will read in uh, this particular chapter, that COVID-19, it's a time for reforms. Because when we are talking that we will survive somehow right now and after we will start reform, uh, unfortunately, antibodies, which uh, in organism of our people against reforms, it's very, very strong during the, uh, crisis time, during the COVID-19 war time, this antibody uh, could be overcome, I could tell you this way. And the, uh, my maybe um, last slide, um, uh, which I'd like to show you, you see it's absolutely awful dementor. It's, uh, no, it's not uh, written in my book because uh, everything is uh, happened um, recently. In my book, it's still written that central bank is absolutely new modern institution. That institutional capacity of central bank is so strong that one man show is not anymore the case in Ukraine. And also in my um, book, uh, I have uh, a lot of recommendations for reformers, uh, what to do, how to start, how to do that. But unfortunately, what I observe right now is that uh, all reforms could be reversible. And of course, uh, I'd like to uh, today uh, with Paul and uh, Katarina, they will help me maybe to write the next chapter of my book, how to do reform irreversible. What safeguard mechanism should be implemented to protect reforms and reforms and reformers? For me, it's a very, very uh, crucial because when I left Central Bank uh, three years, I was very happy to observe that uh, institutional capacity of, central, uh, of Ukrainian Central Bank preserved all reform. Uh, our macrofinancial uh, stability is still there. We have stable uh, foreign currency exchange rate. We have low inflation, the lowest possible inflation. We had very profitable uh, banking sector. And I was so proud of that. But uh, three months ago, uh, the governor of Central Bank, Mr. Smalley, put his resignation letter because of political uh, pressure. And he publicly announced all of that. And right now, what I uh, see in a central bank that um, uh, during two uh, months, uh, 30 professionals already uh, left central bank. And I have no doubts 
that uh, exodus of the most professional uh, people uh, in the central bank in one day uh, will become the real uh, lose of independence. And uh, of course, uh, I think we need to protect uh, reforms because otherwise, uh, you know, all international communities supported us. Ukrainian program with IMF was full of conditionality and we did everything and we uh, met all um, prior action and structural uh, benchmarks. But right now we see uh, how uh, all our success reforms are unfortunately rolling back. And that's why uh, I think it's uh, <clears throat> maybe <clears throat> Uh, we will discuss later on, but it's the end of uh, my speech and my book uh, already in Amazon. And of course, you can read it in absolutely free of charge at LSE website, uh, our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Valeria. Uh, not only that she is a, a passionate um, um, reformer, but she's also um, a fierce thinker. Um, and uh, have given us a lot to think about. Um, but we are resisting questions at this point. I'd like to turn uh, and give the floor to Dr. Katarina Maternova. Um, she is the Deputy uh, Director General uh, of the European Commission's European Neighborhood and Enlargement uh, Negotiations. Um, Katarina has had a very distinguished um, uh, record uh, working beforehand in the DG Regional Policy where she was in uh, charge of the cohesion policy coordination between uh, the crucial times of 2007 and 2010. Um, she had also senior positions in other institutions such as the World Bank, and she worked, of course, in the reform government of Slova Slovakia uh, in 1990 and 2002. So very rich experience. Uh, Katerina, the floor is yours. We are excited to hear what you, you think about the subject. Thank you very much, uh, Piroshka, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, Valeria, for actually your energy and stamina and inspiration that uh, you put into the book. And uh, and I, I I had a chance to not read it cover to cover yet, but already have seen that a lot of the discussions that we've had over the years uh, are very much uh, reflected in there. And I think it's fantastic that you are writing it. I was expecting to speak after Paul. Um, but just uh, simply because I very much agree that in terms of the anchoring of the key reforms in uh, Ukraine over the last several years, the IMF has, has played really a pivotal role. And uh, we have all relied on, uh, on uh, uh, the IMF's uh, sort of uh, leadership on a number of the, of the issues, but, but I think that uh, Indeed, the EU has, has been uh, uh, central in that process as well. But before I get to, the, to Ukraine itself, let me just uh, pay a tribute to Valeria herself personally, in the sense that, and I have done myself uh, a lot of thinking about uh, reforms uh, and how they happen and uh, and sort of realizing that reforms is really not about the technocratic solutions but about political management of uh, of big changes and i think what uh, one of the things that uh, i very much believe in is that individuals matter people matter mm -hmm. and and it is actually individual courage and determination and perseverance that uh, can make or break uh, 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 complex uh, reform process. And I, I think, Valeria, you yourself have been such a mover of, uh, of big and important changes in uh, Ukraine. You talked about them yourself. I'm sure Paul will comment on the individual reforms. I just wanted to sort of talk about the reformology aspect of it. I haven't myself put a book together, but I have written a couple articles on, on reformology. And the fact that what you need for a successful reform is, is a recognition that status quo is not good enough. And then the political vision and will. And the third, but the third ingredient, and I think you, you made yourself the point very clearly, is the implementation. Is the path between the vision 
and 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 what happens next and i think that in this respect the the reform of the central bank and all the reforms that you uh, did not only with the bank as an institution but uh, but the banking sector reform as well as the the uh, floating of the currency etc have been uh, really not only well thought through but were practically implemented in a in a in a in a very good way so i would say for that uh, uh, you had a team with you but but your your personal uh, perseverance and determination I think have been a, a key ingredient in that. Now, um, you mentioned that Ukraine started from a, uh, in an unenviable situation. Uh, I'm not a macroeconomist, so I'm not gonna get into numbers, but th there are two numbers that actually I find striking that uh, uh, at the time of the reforms uh, with, uh, with, with fallen apart economy, et cetera, uh, Ukraine was still putting between five and 6% of GDP a year to defense. And I think this is a figure that needs to be really taken on board when, when commenting on what's happening. And the same amount went every year and still is going every year to debt service. So obligations of the previous uh, uh, governments. And this really limits the scope for, for policy makers. So it's actually uh, admirable, uh, how Ukraine has come a long way because I think it is a, a, a transformed country. The one of the reforms which we were proudly uh, supporting and, and, and have accompanied, and I think is one of the most consequential reforms in Ukraine has been the decentralization reform. And the fact that you can go to any part of Ukraine, I was the other I think last year or the year before, I was five kilometers from the contact line, and the the, the vibrancy of the of the local community and and the the economic and social life there, I think is is actually a great testimony to the reforms being very far-reaching uh, so far. Now I'll, I'll I'll stop by saying that reforms is not a linear process, and I think. Valeria, you ended the same way as I was going to, to end. You and I had uh, many discussions about, um, you know, can you make reforms uh, reversal proof? Can you structure something into um, the, the, the institutional support uh, or institutional uh, system of, of, of this or that uh, uh, reform effort that would prevent uh, their reversal. And uh, I think that in some respects, yes, you can, you can build institutions and make reforms not so dependent on the individuals once they happen. Uh, in Slovakia, for example, where I come from, um, the government that was there before uh, the government of uh, ex-Prime Minister Fico was not sure about the fiscal profligacy of the of the incoming government so they set up a fiscal stability board which actually has managed to keep uh, keep uh, the fiscal reins on the country over 15 years and changing governments and it proved to be one of those institutions but even that's not bulletproof if somebody really wanted to undo it it probably could happen so all i can say is that uh, uh, let us very much hope that we will not in a few months or years talk about the independence of Ukraine Central Bank only in the past tense. I very much hope that uh, we will be able to talk to it in the present tense and the EU will be there with the authorities to try to ensure that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your uh, wonderful, uh, wonderfully warm, appreciative words to uh, to our colleague uh, Valeria, and 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 the wise words also uh, for you know informing her next book about how to safeguard uh, reforms. Um, and now I'm turning uh, to uh, to Paul, uh, Paul Thompson. Um, he is currently visiting professor in practice at the London School of Economics, uh, our place. 
um, and within it the European Institute. Uh, Paul is very well known in European and global circles uh, for having uh, been the director of the European Department um, of the IMF uh, for um, a long periods of six uh, years and even before then uh, working um, very, um, uh, spending a lot of time in that part of the world um, in uh, the advanced uh, uh, European context, uh, working with the ECB and the European Com Commission and the Eurogroup, of course, but also working uh, on, on, uh, on, uh, on what proved to be a very long list of, of, uh, of programs uh, in, um, in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, Paul, um, uh, the floor is, 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 is yours. Um, I wanted to mention actually that you were even uh, a ResRep in, well, head of the Russian operation at some point and, and that's represented in, in, in Russian Federation. So his expertise really um, is, is very broad, uh, both in depth and, and regionally. Uh, Paul, uh, the floor is yours um, uh, to follow up on, on the comments of, um, of Katarina. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, thanks for inviting me. So let me, uh, uh, let me go straight to the issue. Uh, as as Groska mentioned, I, ha I have overseen the IMF's work on Ukraine for more than 15 years, so I think I can say I have been longer and more closely involved than most in the international community. And I think I therefore can say with some confidence that, uh, no, to put it diplomatically, uh, uh, that Ukraine has been a frustrating case. Uh, much have been achieved for sure, but there have also been a lot of unfulfilled promises, not, not, not least because of exceptional governance problems, yes, because of corruption. But I can say with, with a, a similar confidence that I could think of very few senior policymakers who have achieved as much progress as Valeria did during her tenure as uh, governor of the National Bank of Ukraine. And I could think of even fewer who have done it against such formidable odds, with such personal integrity and courage, and at such great personal cost. It has been a truly great pleasure to work with you, uh, Valeria. On the book, I like it very much. It's hands-on and unpretentious. It achieves what it sets out to do, namely to provide other policymakers with concrete advice on what to do and how to prioritize and sequence reforms. This is not grand theorizing or long discussion of analytical issues, but practical advice from an experienced policymaker. I have little doubt that new generations of, of officials inside and outside Ukraine will find this book to be very useful. I also agree with the description of the main achievements. Let me emphasize three areas. First, the modernization of the internal operations and organization of the National Bank. The National Bank of Ukraine made huge progress towards becoming a modern central bank during Valeria's tenure. She completed the move from a central planning type central bank to a slimmed down and well-focused market-oriented modern one. Above all, she managed to maintain its political independence, which is a particularly impressive achievement in Ukraine's unforgiving and difficult political context. Second, she greatly improved the instruments and framework for the conduct of monetary policy. Particularly important in this regard was her commitment to a flexible exchange rate policy. The lack of such exchange rate flexibility had been a major, perhaps the most important problem for, for macroeconomic stability since the beginning of the transition. Despite an exceptionally difficult environment with significant balance of payments pressures, Valeria maintained a flexible exchange rate, but did it in a pragmatic way, at times resorting to some temporary capital controls. Third, she seriously strengthened banking supervision, a particularly difficult and I should say dangerous job in Ukraine with its impaired legal system and influence of powerful oligarchs. Nationalizing a bank owned by a powerful oligarch with his own army speaks for itself. But as I mentioned, Ukraine's overall policy record has been mixed, if not disappointing. On the positive side, 
to successful macroeconomic stabilization. And here I'm thinking both about monetary and fiscal policy. In the midst of a severe armed conflict within the country's borders is truly impressive. Valeria can take credit for this. She can also take credit for the aforementioned structural reforms in the financial area. What broader structural reforms have been a big disappointment. Here I talk about big ticket issues like privatization and reforms of state enterprises, reforms of the powerful and important energy sector, land reforms, and above all, reform of the deeply compromised legal system and broader reforms to curtail pervasive corruption. Little has been achieved, frankly, in these areas. Something has been achieved, but given that we are 30 years after the transition, 30 years into the transition process, it is areas of very significant disappointment. This leads me to my main question. And I, I realize that Valeria uh, you know, uh, recognizes uh, the issue, she raised it already. But to me, the key issue is to what extent are the achievements described by Valeria irreversible? My sense from the tone of the book is that I am probably somewhat more pessimistic than Valeria. As a matter of fact, I think that the achievements, and Valeria recognizes this in her opening remarks, are already on the track, and that some of them have already been reversed. I'm thinking first and foremost about central bank independence. Valeria's successor as governor has been forced to resign, yielding to political pressures. Several of her deputies have also been forced out, and those who remain are being harassed by the media and by other unreformed public institutions. Central bank independence is again on a serious track. I know that this is a major concern among those responsible for Ukraine within the international community. Another concern is the reversal, is the possible reversal of the nationalization of private bank. So far, this has not happened. Although it is very uncertain where we stand with the previous owner having significant ability to sway the domestic legal system. The main hope actually appears to be that he is now under serious scrutiny by law enforcement in foreign jurisdictions. To me, this is the litmus test. I am no longer part of the policy making community, but if it was up to me, the international community should make it clear, be very firm that they will cut all support if the private, if the private nationalization is in effect reversed because of the failures of the domestic political, domestic legal system. We are talking about five to six billion here, but above all, we are talking about the basic features of governance and the business climate. So this is the question I have to all of you. This is the question I have to Valeria. Are we not too optimistic about the endurance and robustness of reforms in the financial sector, given the governance problems in the economy at large, given the capture of the political system by powerful vested interests? The financial sector is not an isolated island, and certainly not politically. What can be done to strengthen this robustness? I think, for instance, that the international financial community, uh, the international community should be willing, as I said, to cut off support for Ukraine uh, if, uh, if, 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 if they, they cross this red line on, uh, on, uh, on, on Privat. Sometimes you know, Ukraine is politically, geopol no, geopolitically uh, uh, important, and that could be a weakness for reforms if money is flowing too easily because of geopolitical concern. My own view is also that nothing is going to last without deep and radical reforms of the legal system. Let me tell you an anecdote told to me by a senior official in the new agency to combat corruption set up under pressure from international financial institutions a few years ago. They had caught somebody in the act, somebody with the fingers in the cookie jar. They then had three days to get a judge to approve that he would be put in jail. For three days, none of the judges answered the phones. All cell phones were turned off. After three days, the corruption agency had to give up and let him go. Soon thereafter, the cell phones were up and running again. 
I cannot speak to the truthfulness of this story. It sounds incredible, but I can tell you that Ukraine is awash with similar story about the corruption of the legal system. Legal reforms are mostly outside the mandate of the IMF, the World Bank, and other international financial organizations, which brings me to my last point. I think that Ukraine will only make lasting progress as part of the process of integration with Europe. As I said at the beginning, I have been involved in the region for a long time. I know two neighbors in countries, particularly well, Romania and Poland. I was assigned to Romania when I first arrived at the front in 1982 in the dark days of Ceausescu. Months later, I headed the missions to Poland. These two countries were not much different from Ukraine at, from Ukraine at the outset. But the way EU membership has allowed Poland and Romania, the former more than the latter, to leapfrog and achieve the kind of accelerated developments familiar from Asia country, Asian countries like Korea and Japan in the 60s and 70s is truly impressive. Nothing catalyzes reform as a requirement to achieve compliance with the EU's acquis communautaire. The exact form of this integration takes me beyond my reform and expertise, and this takes us to the issue of Russia. One cannot seriously discuss Ukraine without discussing its relationship with Russia. I shall not go into this, except for making one last point here. Ukraine has deep economic relations with Russia. Ukrainian and Russian business people know each other. They know how to work in each other's countries. This is a great competitive advantage which Ukraine should use. Preserving and safeguarding economic relations with Russia during this difficult time with the aim of deepening them when the political conflict has been settled should, in my view, be a priority of economic policy makers. Let me, I had planned to stop here, but let me just now we, uh, respond to one more point on, uh, on COVID-19. I am a firm believer of that one should not waste the crisis, that my whole career has been about that. Crisis should not be wasted. But at the same time, we need to be very mindful of the context. If we talk about a country where the dysfunction of the political system has caused a crisis, caused a crisis, then I definitely think one should insist on reform, deep reform, as a quid pro quo from support from the international financial community. But in a case like this, where there are many countries with very well-functioning political systems that are being hit by this crisis, I do not think that support from the international institution, like my former institution, the IMF, should be conditional on, on uh, uh, no, should, should, be a, should have attached to them political conditionality or economic conditionality. I think that that would stretch the legitimacy of these institutions. I do not think that in this crisis one can go in and insist on a pro quid pro quo in the form of economic uh, changes as, 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 so, so, as, you know, as, as a condition for support uh, in, in most countries. So uh, uh, I just wanted to, to make that point. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Uh, very rich uh, and, and pointing to important directions on, 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 on what really can make uh, reforms uh, reversible or, or not. And also the role of, 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 the, of the geopolitical context, the role of the EU and, and other neighboring countries such as Russia. Um, in this case. So we have, uh, we have uh, not too much, but some time for, for questions. Um, uh, several of them are going around this whole notion of irreversibility. Um, and uh, you have all uh, had expressed um, your, your views on, on, on what, what might work. As Katarina said, it is not a, a linear process, reform never is. Uh, Paul also stressed the importance of, uh, of what I would call simultaneous reforms. You cannot have just one area uh, uh, galloping ahead and, 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 and doing all the right work while the rest is left behind because incentives, vested interest might undermine the, um, the, uh, the, the progress uh, in the forefront. Um, but there is one question, one interesting philosophical question. So let me throw out for a quick answer if possible. And, and that comes from Peter O'Kane and, and he asks, if a set of reforms are not reversible, is it not potentially undemocratic? Um, I don't know whether we really want to go around, but I think it's, it's an important uh, food for thought 
so how you change and when you change and, and what, uh, what the democratic process uh, um, you know, is about, uh, um, uh, when about reformers. I don't know if any one of you would like to offer a, a, a quick, quick thought on that. Okay, let's start with me and after, of course, Paul and Katerina will uh, follow. And, uh, you know, uh, we're always discussing about reforms, democracy. Reforms, it's a quite technocratic moment. If you decided that uh, inequality uh, rate should drop 20% uh, next five years, you should have your KPIs. If you have your KPIs, after you have your strategy and your tactics, how you could get from the point A to point B. It's what uh, about reforms. Do not mix reforms with ideas. Yes, reforms, of course, KPIs should be uh, agreed on a policy level. But after, reformers should do their technical work. It's my answer. Okay, uh, very interesting. I'm <laughs> sure we will be uh, able to discuss uh, for a long time. Uh, Katerina, may I ask your views? I, I don't think that uh, true irreversibility of reforms exists. I gave the example of the fiscal board in Slovakia. Even that could be reversed if somebody really wanted to. It was strong enough to sustain uh, four changes of government. Hopefully it will but uh, that's why I don't think that true reversibility uh, is, is realistic. Um, but since I'm talking, and that's why I was uh, a little bit sad I didn't go after Paul. So I have to, for, for the listeners that are listening about, about, uh, uh, about Ukraine, let me just say that there are three aspects, Paul, I really, really disagree with. I don't think it's, I, I certainly would not say that little has been done in Ukraine on energy, land, and even the pervasive corruption. You know, this government actually liberalized land, unbundled NAFTA gas, has done a lot of reform. So yes, it's halfway, but I think a lot has been done. But more importantly, I think it's a success of Ukraine of having completely transformed the trade flows and economic direction from Russia and from the former Soviet Union towards the European market. I think this is a huge success. We are up 60% with the, with the, with the trade. And, and I, we certainly would not be advising Ukraine to be capitalizing on their ties with Russia. I think that more integration in the value chains with Europe is actually uh, something that's a, that's a net positive for the economy. And the last point, I think that everybody, and because this is really, it's about the reversibility of reforms, it's about sustainability of reforms as well. Uh, the judicial system in, uh, in Ukraine is a problem. And it's, uh, it's something that still needs to be very much reformed. But let's not forget, let's look at all of the new member, so-called new member states. The one sector, the one area, the one institutional uh, uh, setup in all of our countries that continues to be a problem, whether you look at Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, you name it, is the judiciary. And that's not a coincidence. It was under Western advice when the changes happened that, was, that the stress on independence was put and nobody talked about accountability. So we actually suddenly have all the judiciaries in these countries independent and you solidified incompetence and corruption in its midst. And the trouble we have in Ukraine now is that how do you want to achieve uh, private bank uh, not, uh, you know, not, not reversing it if the, if the courts are independent and corrupt? Right, so I think we have a we have a, a big systemic issue is how do you reform? And this is a third book, Valeria. How do you actually reform the judiciaries that, in the meantime, all became independent? So the government cannot influence it easily. How do you build the kind of consensus or the kind of uh, 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 reformability of the system like they did in Albania now that they actually had two years discussion and a constitutional amendment to that. 
how to reform the judiciaries that are independent is is one of the big uh, one of the big questions. Thank you so much, Katarina. Paul, uh, I, I give the floor to you too. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, on the on the first part of the question on on uh, on whether it's inconsistent with you know uh, demo being undemocratic, uh, uh, I I I certainly it 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 goes to the fundamental issue that no reforms will stick if there's no domestic ownership. I mean, if there's one lesson we have, I have from all these years in the IMF is you cannot impose these reform from outside. You can, but they will not stick. So uh, you have to have domestic ownership. And if, if uh, that part of the question, I very much agree. Uh, uh, but of course, the uh, you know, support from the international community is not, is not a right. Uh, 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 the, it is also legitimate that the, that the international community, which represent democratic countries, impose some, some, uh, some requirements uh, uh, to, to be sure that, that there's an effective use of, of, its, uh, of, of, of its money. Uh, on, on, let me just briefly comment on what uh, Katerina said. I'm not, uh, she and I have, uh, I think, a, a, a long history of me being more, more pessimistic than she is. So let, I will not, uh, I will not uh, bother you with, with this. But I would strongly, I mean, I welcome the deepening, strongly welcome, and I said this, the deepening of integration with Europe. But I would not celebrate it as something that's being achieved at the expense of relations with Russia. That is a false trade-off. It's a false trade-off uh, uh, politically, I think, but that's beyond my, my remit, but certainly economically. Russia and Ukraine has deep historical economic relations, and it does not make any sense to, to promote policies that curtail them and say that if we have more trade, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with Europe, uh, that's good, and less with, uh, with Russia is, is, is good. No, it does not make sense. It's a false trade-off. So I would, I would, uh, I, I would strongly uh, in, encourage you, Ukrainian policymakers uh, uh, not to succumb to sort of populism in, in, in this, in this uh, environment and, and, and do whatever they can to preserve long-term relations with Russia economically. Uh, Piroska may add uh, one uh, very quick <laughs> remark. Okay. It's a very important discussion uh, and uh, the main... Uh, uh, Paul, you remember that uh, uh, prior action in 2015 was the uh, uh, independence of the central bank. And that's why uh, we uh, prepared the special legislation and our parliament voted for this uh, national bank law in 2015. And after we got IMF tranche, 1.7 billion. And when Smali put his resignation letter and uh, said uh, because of political uh, persecution and political pressure, I immediately uh, gave uh, my interview to Central Banking Magazine. And my point was uh, that, you know, uh, do not allow, uh, uh, IFIs uh, should not protect themselves to be foolish. Uh, because if you already paid 1.7 billion uh, like uh, tranche for independence of central bank, but after, uh, you know, it, it reverse in, uh, on your, uh, at your eyes, uh, you, you know, I think it's absolutely not acceptable. And it was my call to IMF that maybe it should be some special uh, close in agreement that if you reverse this particular prior action, we will ask you to, uh, uh, to uh, pay back this particular tranche. It's quite instrumental, but you know what finally I got from this? No reaction from IMF, but immediate reaction from Ukrainian KGB, it was security service. They issue a uh, public reprimand for Gontreva and my public interview to say uh, Central Banking Magazine, you know, it's a very good uh, idea how to do some reform, uh, reform irreversible. Uh, we are getting uh, to the end of, of, our, of our very lively debate. We are proving that even with Zoom, we can have a sparkle of, of really deep discussion. And, 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 and I, I very much enjoy that. We have uh, quite a few other questions, um, some of them technical in nature. So um, 
I'd like to promise uh, to Donald Bryden and Lucas Spielenberg that we are getting back uh, to you. Uh, Valeria will get back to you to answer very specific questions that, that you raised on swap lines and, and, and other um, segments. Um, we have a time um, constraint. So let me very quickly summarize perhaps at least what I see the takeaway has been from this exceptionally rich and lively debate uh, for which I, in the name of all of our uh, audiences here on, 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 on Zoom, but also on uh, live stream Facebook, I want to thank you. Um, you all paid a tribute to Valeria. Uh, I think she's a wonderful reformer and, and we, we thank her for what she's done. And, and we um, uh, very much appreciate um, also your leadership helping in, in other countries to, to, to do similar reforms. The discussion was about the concerns over reform reversals. And indeed, a uh, very rich um, um, mentioning of, of institutions, um, sequencing of reforms, uh, the role of uh, uh, IFIs, um, and, and, um, and, uh, and a certain uh, steps that the IFIs can, can take, uh, maybe politically uh, difficult steps uh, to support uh, what, is, what is the right uh, for the country. Um, we, um, you discussed also the, uh, we discussed also the, the, the geopolitical uh, context in which Europe has to be seen. It's, it's, it's in the intersection of, 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 of the EU and, and, and Russia. Both are very important and, and perhaps complementary players, as, as, as Paul said. And finally, I'd like to mention something that we didn't say, but it was evident from this discussion. You, 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 we had a discussion in which um, a committed reform leader from an, an important country, Ukraine, um, demonstratively showed very strong collaboration with the, the European Commission and the IFIs. It seems to me that if there is another role model that we can speak about is, is how to do business uh, by international organizations with, with a country when there is a commitment for reform. Yes, as Paul said, you have to have uh, the, 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 the domestic uh, democratic process in place uh, to be open and support. Um, um, but then the IFIs can, can play a very, very important role. And we, we saw the display of, of a wonderful collaboration that, that has really had the reforms, which hopefully will not be fully reversed in Ukraine. With that, I'd like to thank all our speakers, Valeria, Katerina, Paul. This was a phenomenal discussion and to our audience to, uh, to stay with us and to tell you that, that we will have the next uh, similar series from the Deputy Governor of the National Bank of Hungary, Julia Kirai, who has just published her new book uh, about the you know, developments in that country and in that region. We will be welcoming her on November 4th and we hope to see you there and at other webinars uh, of the LSE. Thank you very much. Thank you.